How's it going, guys? My name is Tavarish, and I have a problem. Now, my problem isn't that I bought a $2 million McLaren P1 that was destroyed in a major hurricane. It's also not the fact that we took it apart and found more sand and corrosion than the Titanic. And it's definitely not that I decided to take this rusty bucket of bolts and attempt to turn it into the world's fastest McLaren. No, my problem is right here on this table. You see, what this is, is a wiring harness, essentially the nervous system of the most technologically advanced McLaren ever made. And none of it, none of this is usable. But today, we're gonna fix this and breathe new life into my flooded hypercar. I hope. Welcome to my nightmare. So this is what I've been dealing with for the past several weeks. Now, a lot of you have been wondering, where's the P1 and why isn't it done? And well, this is the reality of what happens when a hypercar goes in the ocean, the salt water ocean, because salt water and copper does not mix. So everything you see here, this entire wiring harness that you can't get from McLaren without having up to a year wait is completely toast. And in order to fix it, the plan was simple. We would take a wiring harness from a McLaren 650S and 720S strip them down to their bare components, and then put them together to hopefully form a functioning harness for a P1. But as Adam from Smart EFI will now explain, it was far from simple. A project like this is incredibly complex. It's not simple, it's not straightforward. There's a lot of figuring out what McLaren did. We have, luckily, all the diagrams from McLaren for this car and for these other two cars, so I have had to compare page by page, circuit by circuit, everything between the three cars and make notes of all the differences between the cars so that we can take those two harnesses and combine them together. Yeah. And then on top of that, add in all the stuff that neither of those cars had that are specific to the P1. Yeah. And, and, the, and make it all work. So the P1 is different than any other McLaren on earth. Not only does it have the hybrid drive assembly, well, we're not gonna be using that in my build, but it still has that in the harness. It has stuff like active aero in the front and the back. A lot of people don't know that it has active aero in the front, has little flaps that come down. That all has to be wired in. It has a, a hydraulic suspension that also has to be wired in. The steering rack, that's also electric over hydraulic. Then it has stuff like the radio. The doors are different than any other McLaren because it has switches on the doors. And then you got all the stuff that we don't even think about, like the fact that it has way more fans than any other McLaren because of course it does, has more radiators, has more cooling. So this is a giant project because I thought, hey, we could just take these two harnesses and just kind of slap them together and boom, we'll have enough wires and harnesses and, and fittings. And it turns out it's probably the same thing as making this from whole cloth. Before we removed the P1's corroded harness from the table, Adam drew out a diagram by hand so we can have an idea of what the new harness would need, and he took a ton of pictures just in case we ever had to move the tables around. We then plopped the new donor harness on the table with all the confidence in the world. Ready? Yeah. Look, it's perfect! Done! Wow, we're done, yay! Hey. Fantastic, okay. All right, have a wonderful time. I don't wanna be here. This is giving me anxiety, bye. Now we're working really, really hard to make sure my McLaren P1 is operating at its peak performance. Now in any other case other than me rebuilding a flooded one, you should always, always take your car to a trained professional, someone who has years of experience working on cars. And the same can be said about mental health, which is why today's sponsor, BetterHelp, is a game changer when it comes to keeping your health at its peak performance. 
Now, BetterHelp makes it really easy to connect with a therapist who can help you work through whatever you're facing. First, you go to their site. You can use my link, betterhelp.com slash Tavarish. They'll ask you a series of questions, and based on your answers, they'll match you up with one of their 30,000 plus therapists who they think can help you out the most. Now, the therapist that they pick for you will have tons of experience dealing with whatever you're going through, and that was absolutely the case when I used it. Every single one of their therapists is licensed, has either a master's or doctorate degree, and has spent over three years and a thousand hours working with people just like you. But if for some reason it doesn't work out for you, you can always switch to a new therapist with a click of a button. Now this is coming from me. You guys need to treat your minds like you treat your cars. Go to betterhelp.com slash Tavarish or select Tavarish at checkout to get a special discount on your first month of therapy. It's in the link in the video description below. Go check it out. Super worth it right now. Adam laid out the approximate position of the harness, then started the painstaking work of figuring out what each connector does, eliminating ones we don't need, and adding the hundreds of wires that we do need. The wiring diagrams that we got from all three cars were absolutely essential to this process, but they were only one small step forward, since every single wire would have to be checked individually multiple times throughout the build. And it's at this point in the video, however, that I'll point out that we haven't actually seen the car in the episode yet. And that's because next door, Jack and Rex were rolling it out so we can do some more modifications. And here it is. Now, this car doesn't look much different since the last time you saw it, which was probably after the SEMA show, but today, all that is gonna change. Now you'll notice that this thing still is wrapped and this wrap was always gonna be a temporary wrap, even though I do love the Valvoline livery. Now we have to take this off because the final version of this car is gonna be exposed carbon and candy on top of that exposed carbon. But in order for us to do that, we have to get this bodywork straight. And today we're gonna to start the process on getting that bodywork straight. But the first step of that process is getting this wrap off. It's just like removing a sticker and you just peel up and you're doing great. You're doing great. That's easy. Thanks, Dad. Look at that. Look at that. You know, I actually do like the yellow on this. Like yellow. It's pretty. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a big fan of yellow cars in general, but like on this car, I think it pops. It I makes like the, the carbon stand out. Yeah, the pearl is really, really nice. Too bad we're not keeping it like that. Catch. It's weird when people throw things at my face like that, but I usually catch it. <laughs> Too early for that kind of humor, Jack. A vinyl wrap has a strong adhesive layer underneath that lets it stick to the car's bodywork, but it isn't too aggressive that it would pull the paint up with it. It's also really common to use a heat source when installing and removing because it makes the material much more pliable. But since we were in Florida, it was plenty warm enough for us to remove the wrap as it was. Like a band-aid, you just gotta rip it off. So the good thing about this is that it hasn't been on the car that long and it hasn't been in the sun at all. So usually what happens with these vinyl wraps, if you leave them out, is that they start to get really brittle and then they break off in these tiny, tiny, tiny little chunks and it makes it almost impossible to take off. But I mean, we have most of the door already done and it's been like two minutes. I don't think I can get this off in one big chunk, but yeah, see, I just, I don't have the dexterity that Jack does. As we removed more of the temporary Valvoline camo wrap, our old enemy reared its ugly head once again. Discovered. This car still has sand. Lots of sand. Look at that. It just keeps coming. It's not stopping. I can't stop. Sand. Sanding. Same thing on this side. How many times have we actually cleaned this car? I don't know. I Has it been like 20? I can't even keep track anymore. You should donate this for the next Dune movie. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be perfect. I think it'll be a great car. 
I should call this Shai Haloon. <laughs> <laughs> You really don't notice how many parts a car has until you have to tend to every single one. For instance, the wing on the P1 is actually made of two pieces, and both of them are super wide and require a bit of skill to unwrap. Thankfully, we had a jack of all trades. And no, that will not be the last dad joke you hear on this channel. Now everything is off. Now everything, now all the vinyl is no, no the vinyl. it's not. Some of the vinyls are off. Okay, some of the vinyl is off on this car, <laughs> and I wanted to show you another problem that we ran into. Uh, so we, we checked that side, and I'm pretty sure this side is gonna be this exact same thing. So I'm gonna demonstrate what the issue is. Now, usually when you have carbon fiber like this, this is what's called visual carbon fiber. You can actually see the weave. There's a clear coat on top of it and it looks generally nice. Now in my stupid brain, I thought since this is just painted, we could sand down the paint and it's gonna be nice carbon fiber. Unfortunately, this is what we get. So what Jack just did was he exposed the carbon fiber underneath. He sanded down all the paint, but what you see right here is actually a layer of body filler, which is like Bondo. And no, the car has not had any accidents or anything like that. This is from the factory. So the factory puts on a skim of body filler, then they put on a sealer, then a primer, and then the paint, and then the clear coat, right? Correct, yes. So the problem though is not that. The problem is this is very, wavy and it's not visually as pretty and clean as this and then they apply body filler to make it smooth and get all your shapes but that's not the problem completely the yeah. problem that we have is something else yeah if you look right here there's two different types of carbon fiber this is like a patchwork quilt of carbon fiber and when you put on water this simulates what it's like with clear coat yeah you can see right here that's one weave, that's a different weave. And if we just clear coat it on top of this, it would look like absolute garbage. So um, what we need to do is we need to strip off all of the paint because we want this to be exposed carbon fiber, but also we want it to have one cohesive weave the entire car. So this would have to be veneered. Essentially, uh, all the paint would have to come off and then we'd put on a new layer of carbon fiber to make sure all the weave matches up. And that is a very, very time consuming and very tedious process. That's why we're gonna take this to my friend Sean at Attacking the Clock, where he's gonna take a lot of cutting implements to my very expensive, very bespoke $2 million hypercar. I am, I am about to hyperventilate. I don't want to toot my own horn, but lifting the back end of a car by yourself always makes you feel like you're competing for world's strongest man. Even if it is in a car with no engine or bodywork, and it's made of the lightest materials on earth. We then bolted some dollies onto the back of the P1 to make sure it could actually roll. And that's when I realized I could kill two dirty birds with one stone. Now, since the chassis is going to get modified and fit up correctly, I wanted to take off the suspension because it really is a cool piece. I mean, this is all CNC'd and it looks awesome other than the fact that it looks like crap because of the corrosion and rust and it works like everything works fine it only had 300 miles on it but we have to get this corrosion off so i'm gonna try to see if i can clean it up using some different methods uh but right now we gotta get this on the trailer a not so well kept secret is that mechanical work on a mclaren isn't actually that hard to do you can detach the entire suspension assembly by undoing a handful of 13 millimeter bolts and nuts. And since it's all made of something called aluminum, it was quite light, decreasing any chances of the suspension assembly coming off and turning your hand into hamburger meat.
we rolled our beloved sandworm of the desert into the parking lot and attempted to load it onto the trailer, which is a bit tricky when the back wheels can move in any direction and the front wheels don't have a steering wheel attached to them. We did get it though, eventually. Don't let anybody ever tell you that loading a P1 onto a trailer that isn't worth a lot of money is a, uh, is a sketchy thing to do. We're totally safe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. Oh, yeah. Trailer, dude. These are expensive. Yeah. <laughs> this is an aluminum trailer, except it's steel that it's just painted silver. So it looks like it's an aluminum trailer. <laughs> it also doesn't have any brakes. This was in the Fast and Furious. It was not in the Fast and Furious, actually. I got it from the people that <laughs> made Fast and Furious cars. But my trip. Fun fact. So I actually had a trailer uh, that I donated to the people that make Fast and Furious movies. And in the last, I think in Fast 9, uh, I saw my trailer in the movie. Uh, this is not a joke, it's not a bit, it's, it's for real, you can go check it out. I think it's at the nine minute mark. Uh, young Vin Diesel, or young Dominic Toretto, is, uh, he jumps up on top of the trailer. That's my trailer, so, there you go. Remember the song? I'm riding spinners, I'm riding spinners. They don't stop. Start. With Shai Halud secured, we brought out some other parts that needed help with fitment, including the one of one exposed carbon rear clamshell that on its own was the size of a small car. We carefully lowered it onto the bed of my truck and then headed on our way with the knowledge that this was probably the first time in history that a McLaren P1 had ever been towed with a 25 year old 300,000 mile Ford F350. We unloaded the frame, and as always, I was calm as a cucumber. And here we are at attacking the clock, and the car is here, and I am really nervous because this is a giant, giant clamshell. It's exposed carbon, and I am very uh, scared of putting any sort of cutting implements on this, but you know who isn't scared? Sean. Yeah, no. I woke up this morning, nice cup of coffee, thinking today's a perfect day to cut up a McLaren. One thing that I wanted to make very, very clear is that, you know, this is a one-off part. This is also a one-off part made from a race car. It was molded off a race car. And as you can tell, race cars sometimes have tolerances. Uh, sometimes the body panels aren't exactly that of a road car. So that's why we're having a little bit of fitment issue. But this is what happens when you have such a big part on a you know bespoke car. So we do have to do some modification. He's gonna be doing the modification. And uh, well, I brought Jack along because he is, I mean, he knows everything there is to know about bodywork. That's what you said, not me. That's what I told him. No, I just wanted to make sure that we have all hands on deck uh, on this because uh, it is the most ambitious project I've ever had. Uh, so- This is the most ambitious project on YouTube. On, listen, man, you know, maybe, I don't know. I think so. Yeah, you know, there's-, there's... I have had some time this weekend to look at this project with no one around. Mm -hmm. this, this is huge. This is a big it, undertaking. It Especially is. Especially when you're, I mean, my first instinct is to not use anything McLaren because it's hard. Mm -hmm. And you guys are using everything McLaren because it's hard. Because it's hard. <laughs> yeah, so I yeah. really com commend you guys for doing some really tough stuff. This is not easy. Well, we My are, part, honestly, is the easiest. We are like Reese Witherspoon and Legally Blonde, you know, getting into Harvard Law is like, what, like it's hard, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's real hard. <laughs> yeah. I feel like uh, the car, the clamshell is kind of doing this onto the, you know, the, the, the main portion of the car. So you can't really fit anything on the back of the car because it doesn't want to sit. You can't really fit anything on the, you know, I guess you would call it the cab and of the car because it's kind of squeezing it. So I'm kind of looking at some body lines and I see that essentially this needs to go down and this piece needs to come up when the door's closed. So that makes me think that the whole panel is kind of tweaked, needs to do this. Mm -hmm. So probably the scariest cut for me is probably the easiest decision to make and it's to just cut it in half. Okay. So like down the middle, like right here. Yeah, down the middle because um, possibly in the mold process, um, you know, if you don't support it on the outer edges, 
the mold could tightly squeeze in. Mm -hmm. And on, like you said, on a race car, you just kind of flex it over. Not yeah. a big deal. We do that all the time here. That's mm -hmm. not that's that's race car fitment, but. Yeah. Factory fitment is a lot trickier, um, and I do feel like probably the best thing to do is make the door area fit first. Okay. And then we got that, then we kind of tackle the rest of it and see what kind of more aggressive cuts we need to make. Okay, because uh, I know we've tried to, um, you know, Jack and I have tried to fit this up and we've had, you know, varying degrees of success, but like in order to have all those um, mounts sort of line up, we need so much yeah. force. Yeah, it's like literally, I mean, you got 40 pounds of force down just to get it to the screw to go on. Yeah, and uh, you definitely don't want to put that much force. I mean, you don't want to put any force yeah. on a carbon fiber part because if you take one thing out and then it just goes, bang, you know, it acts like a spring. The entire yeah. thing does. Well, you don't want to do that with anything, though, too, because you think about it, it's like if you're having to force it into place, over time it's just going to rattle itself to death and crack and break. And right. So, it's like, even if it was steel, like, it would do the same thing, but... Being carbon fiber is going to be even like more rigid, so that's yeah. going to end up cracking somewhere down mm -hmm. the line. So, and uh, another thing that we wanted to, you know, make sure we preserve is the exposed carbon element of this because uh, this car will be exposed carbon fiber with a tint over it, and uh, you know, if we're cutting things apart, obviously we can't just slap it back together. So uh, we're going to be veneering this uh essentially right and you you know how to do this yeah so uh the technical term is an overlay mm -hmm. the right way to do this would be to completely make it fit the car fit it and then make another mold off of that mm -hmm. um, but the reality is is that's not cost effective we would be saving ounces you know not pounds yeah so uh you know cutting it and, and doing an overlay on it is gonna yield the same result yeah. with fitment. And it's not like the, the piece isn't carbon fiber, you know? Right. Like we're not overlaying something that's made of plastic. plastic. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So they'll bond well together, overlays I'm not a huge fan of unless it's composite to composite yeah. because like a metal piece or a plastic piece, they have different heat you know, fluctuations and that's why you see a lot of carbon fiber parts de-lam off of non-composite pieces yeah. like a dash or something like that. But this will be fine. Um, but yeah, essentially what we're gonna do is you're gonna get a, potentially a peak in this spot mm -hmm. in the middle if they both have to come down. So what we'll do, have to do is do a, quite a bit of reinforcing on the bottom mm -hmm. so we can basically sculpt the top. Right. Uh, like I said, it's not ideal, but that's what we need to do. You know, yeah. it's not always uh, kittens and rainbows when it comes to carbon fiber work. Exactly, but hopefully at the, end of the, at the end of the build, it should look like an actual car and function like an actual car because uh, we're trying to go very, very stupid, stupid fast in this car. It's gonna be perfect. It's gonna look great. Like I, I'm super excited to see this car going down anywhere where it goes to go super fast and it's gonna be dope, dude. Okay, um, you wanna start cutting? Let's cut it. <laughs> Cutting a carbon fiber clamshell in half is not for the faint of heart, but Sean made it look easy. He first used some tape to mark out where precisely he wanted to cleft the shell in twain, then we brought it outside because carbon fiber dust is really, really bad for you to breathe in, or be around, or generally come into contact with, so ventilation is always a must. After the deed was done, Sean told me that they would need some more parts to really see how the body fit. So I came back the next day with more bodywork to see how my P1 Evo was taking shape. So yeah, cutting in half I think paid off because uh, essentially that relaxed the, the front part of the clamshell and you can see it fits really well. 
Oh. Yeah, that whole thing seems very doable, but that kind of moves our problem back here uh, because, well, we have, well, you, you guys actually put the wing down. All you had to do was uh, loosen up the bleeders here on the hydraulic system, and the wing came right down uh, with a little bit of struggling, but, you know, it wasn't too bad. But this is the stock wing. Uh, the stock wing was exposed carbon, and with this, you can see that there is some discrepancy in terms of fitment. So the wing sort of goes up like this uh, and it has a little hump, but there's also a gap here. There's a gap here and there's a gap there, but not too much of a gap here. So uh, what do you think happened? Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, this is a GTR, you know, back half um, and they come with a fixed wing that actually ties into the chassis underneath the bodywork. Yes. So this doesn't exist on a GTR as you probably know. Yeah. So I think this was wing was from a p1 was grafted into mm -hmm. the gtr bodywork so we're gonna have you know this is when you mix race car and street car together and yeah. and then also things have never been done before exactly so so sometimes i i think they might have put this uh you know this bucket right here that might have been shifted a little too far forward mm -hmm. um so one thing that we may have to do uh is actually move this back um like move the entire bucket back or just remake this part and then just make it follow the contours of the wing. Um, now it's really important that the wing stays like this because this is gonna be a top speed car and when you're at top speed, you wanna have the lowest aero profile that you can. You don't wanna have a ton of you know wing and spoiler here because that's gonna create drag and the car is not gonna be as fast. Um, so we wanna have uh, the stock wing configuration it can do race mode it can go up 12 inches but can also recess back into the car and that's something that no p1 gtr has ever done well said my friend <laughs> <laughs> this piece though has definitely helped us out this is something that we know is kind of oem shaped yeah um, so that is the that's the gtr rear and this attaches to the rear diffuser now this goes on the stock frame rails yep. so these are known points and then these bolt on to the sides so we sort of kind of have a rear end and uh, based on that we can put tail lights in yep. and see where everything wants to sit and then that's when everything here needs to be cut and chopped and screwed and you know yeah because we have a gap here and our next step is to establish because everything fits well with this gap mm -hmm. uh, we want to know is this a natural gap that works with the tail light and bezel yeah. once it's all bolted together or do we still have that same gap with all of those parts bolted in place it then kind of throws a wrench in because once you squeeze it back together then your fitment kind of goes crazy again on the doors so yes. i'm hoping that it actually needs to be like this okay uh hopefully the gap is supposed to stay like that because it really makes everything play fingers nicely. fingers cross i'm gonna yeah. cross all my fingers yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that uh that gap is supposed to be like that i mean we can we can test it out we have all the pieces we yeah. have a um we have a tail light and we have the piece that goes in the middle and we can kind of test it out to see what that looks like but even then it's going to be a lot of custom work you've never seen it with the the back of the car i've never seen the car with the wing down yeah. uh so this is this is kinda quite trippy, cool huh? yeah kind of trippy like it seems like there should be something jutting out the back but yeah dude like it looks it looks really sleek it looks angry but what i like right here is that you know everything lines up the uh the gaps are a little large that's fine because we can always work these gaps but as long as this is flush that's flush that's it's flush in the yeah it's in the wheelhouse yeah. and it's definitely workable and I'm guessing on the other side should be Fitment sort of similar this is way better than it was uh we that's can just low problem. yeah this is a problem we can lower this down a little bit so we're gonna have to take this tab essentially cut it and then remake the tab so this sits down lower okay that should also help pull this up a hair mm -hmm. so i think that's gonna yeah that's... that'll be fine I, I did notice that so this is like a smooth transition down but over there there is a yeah, little bit a little bit of a hump yeah. uh and again this is just a part of the molding process because race car parts sometimes you got a little oopsie or whatever and then it just makes it into the mold so uh, this will have to be brought down. You can you can see that yeah, pronounced hump right there. So this will have to be brought down, probably sand through the carbon, and then put another piece underneath, 
and then we're gonna have to veneer over this entire thing. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately you can't body work, especially out, right? Yeah. So you have to remove, um, yeah, and basically we're gonna have to plane it flat mm -hmm. and then um, sculpt it with the body line and essentially remove anything that's in the way. Yeah. And then uh, you're gonna basically get some weird looking shaped oval on it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we'll reinforce it from the backside and then, and then reinforce it from the top side and then body work it and kind of get to that fine point where we have it where we need to. And then, um, yeah, it's gonna be ugly, but then, you know, that's where whenever we overlay it, it's gonna be pretty, yeah, you'll gonna, never see it again. Yes. But. Another thing that I wanted to talk about is uh, right here, uh, maybe we can do something, you know, custom, maybe some louvers. Uh, there are some vents that go here, some metal vents. Uh, so we'll have to work those in, but uh, I think if we made just a uh, custom piece of carbon, that would be really cool. And that wouldn't be that hard because the stock car just has a flat piece of glass. So we just need a flat piece of carbon and then we can cut it out to whatever we want. Yeah, super easy. Everything's super easy. Everything's super <laughs> easy when you're looking at it yeah. from the other end, you know? It's super easy. It's just real quick. Mm -hmm. No problem. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so I'll, so this this will be done in what? Probably like, by Friday, yeah. By Friday, yeah, yeah, by Friday. Friday. So today's today's <laughs> Wednesday. So Wednesday, I should have a running driving car yeah. that has perfect bodywork. Uh, yeah, this is gonna take um, quite a bit of time, and I thank you so much yeah, because you guys here at Attack on the Clock are absolutely amazing. You know what you're doing, and this is gonna look spectacular. It's really in good hands. Now, I would try to do this myself. Um, Jack is a really good guy yep. with uh, body work, and, and I do want him involved on this, but it's uh, it's just, we have so many more things I'm, to do. I'm saving that little bump right there for Jack. Okay, that's Jack's yeah. bump. Jack can figure that bump out. I'll see you when this is a little more ugly, but functionally better, right? Yeah, I think next steps is getting the taillights, all that stuff kind of in place, um, and then making sure our gap is where it is, and then Essentially, we're gonna backfill that gap so the clamshell's one again, mm -hmm. and then we'll start then figuring out, okay, how does the wing sit in there perfectly, and yeah. then start gapping that process out. Cool, man. Well, take it easy. Yeah. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. All right, this looks awesome. It was finally time to do something about the nasty suspension. So we popped over to our friends at Alex Job Racing and asked them if we could please, please, please use some of their equipment, and unsurprisingly, they said yes. This makes me super excited because we're about to start a process I've never done before. And that process is called vapor blasting. And essentially what it is, is uh, sandblasting, but with water infused so it's not as abrasive. And it should make all our very dirty aluminum parts look brand new. And it shouldn't take any time at all. Now, uh, Rex is here because Rex is also never done this before yeah, this so <laughs> very uncharted to me yeah we're uh we're some vapor blasting virgins um <laughs> don't read into what i just said but it's pretty cool all you have to do is put the stuff in here actually yeah, yeah there's plenty of room so we'll just lay our stuff in there and then a slurry comes out of here that's a mixture of water and beads like glass beads and then it should be I mean, it should be pretty self-explanatory. You turn on the pump and then you blast it, then a clean part should come right out of there. Hopefully. Maybe a brand new part should come out of there. Maybe a brand new P1 part. And hopefully I can see through all this. Uh, yeah, this is definitely the, the tall boy. Cause like, yeah, this is... so I'm 5'7", <laughs> so I don't think I, I'm able to clean here. So I think... are you sure you're not 5'9"? No, I'm 5'7", but what? my wife thinks I'm 5'9". Okay. <laughs> <laughs> The guys here do the kind of work that I can only dream about. They have legit race cars that they maintain, restore, and modify, so it's a no-brainer that they'd probably have some decent equipment to clean up some old parts. We made sure to tape off some of the anodized parts because we didn't know how they would react with the blasting, but the cabinet itself was actually made custom by one of AJR's employees out of an old sandblasting cabinet. It uses a pump and compressed air to blast a mixture of water and glass beads through a giant nozzle to attack any stuck on corrosion, dirt, or debris that you can think of.
It's not as aggressive as dry sandblasting, and it's 10 times as satisfying. And since it's safe on aluminum, sorry, aluminum, we knew that it would make our P1 parts look a bit better. At least, that was the hope. And... Oh, look at that. That looks, that, lo that looks so good. Look at this. Dude, that came out like it's new. That came out great, look at that. Wow. There's no corrosion anywhere here. This was all pitted. That's fine now. I'm just gonna turn this on. Dude, that looks awesome. Look at that. Wow! That <laughs> looks brand new. Okay, I'm a believer of this method. This looks amazing. This looks so good. We need one. Yeah, we need shop. one bad. Yep. Let's compare this to the other one. So this is discolored and it's rusty. And then this, I mean, we were there for maybe five, 10 minutes and already it's super bright. The steel, which I didn't think would actually come out, came out and it just, it looks brand new. Uh, there is still a tiny bit of pitting or whatever, but that is not a problem. I mean, we put this in there for another five, 10 minutes. It's gonna look absolutely spectacular. So this has me, I mean, I'm completely converted. What do you think? I mean, I think you should get one. Yeah, we need one. Yeah, we really need one. I mean, if we got one, you're never gonna see me walking around the shop. I'll be out there just cleaning all the parts. <laughs> I enjoyed the process. It wasn't even, it's really like a no brainer. Like it's so easy to do. It's pretty, look how it came out. It looks yeah. amazing. So now we have to make that look like this. And we also have a few more things that we have to clean, but yeah. we're gonna use, we might use a different yeah, method. Yeah, we should try the other method too and see which one comes out the best. Yeah, this method is gonna be, I'm really excited about that. Yep. I think you all need to experience this just as I'm experiencing this. Look at this man right here. It's really hot in this thing. You look like a Power Ranger. So the reason why Rex is done up like this and I'm not is because we only have one suit and it's Rex's size. And we got one glass. And we only have one pair of glasses. Uh, we're at the dry ice lab, but we're not using dry ice today. Uh, also, this is not my John Deere tractor. <laughs> so we are using something brand new and that is this guy right here. You can put it on your back. Uh, it is a little backpack thing and it does look like we'd be busting ghosts with it, but <laughs> right? it's actually a laser cleaner. So we actually have this, this is our laser cleaner. It has uh, a bunch of stuff in there. That's, uh, that's where the magic happens. That's where the laser goes. And then it goes all the way over here and then laser shoots out of there. And it apparently makes things like this disappear. Now, I have no idea how this works, Rex also is don't have any idea. <laughs> brand new to this. So we are we are also going to be very, very careful. Rex yep. is wearing full PPE. I'm gonna be standing really far back and I'm definitely not gonna be looking at this. Rex has the glasses and- I hope this works. These aren't just regular sunglasses. They're specifically made uh, for this laser. Now, the idea is you press this trigger and then the laser just burns off whatever rust and all that crap that's on here. But honestly, I am really excited to see how this works. Don't know how it works. I don't know if it's good on metal or rubber or anything else. So we're gonna find that out today. So you ready? No. With Rex looking like a Timu Master Chief, we started playing around with this high powered laser to see what we could burn and it was more fun and satisfying than we can ever had hoped for. Having said that, we are not professionals and need much more time with the machine to be proficient. But it was certainly amazing to see beams of light burn away thick layers of corrosion. This is some real next level science fiction technology 
and we're using it to clean up rusty cars. Take a look at this, dude. So you can definitely still see some pitting over here, but it looks so much better. And this was super easy. I mean, we took like one minute to do it. That thing is, yeah, it's night and day, like night and day difference, <laughs> like literally. No, it looks amazing now, dude. All we have to do is maybe go over it with some uh, steel wool. I mean, this, this came out really, really nice. So I say we clean this up and then I think we go and check on Adam with his wiring. Yeah, he's stressed out. So. He, he might be a little stressed out. He but might, he knows what he's doing. I so. think he knows what he's doing and I'm really excited to yep, see what he has in store. For sure. This looks awesome. What are you doing, Adam? Um, I'm making the wire forget what shape it's it's in. So basically, wire has a, a memory of what position it's been in, and when it comes off the spool, it's all curled up, and now it's not. Look at that. You just relax the wire. You have been very, very hard at work. Uh, so this side is already, I can see that you've bunched this side of the harness up and ran quite a bit. Is this complete? Uh, yeah, it is. So um, in the P1, it has rear arrow, uh, active arrow, and the 650S that we used as a base harness did not. So we had to build these out from scratch completely and then repin the TCU completely because the TCU in a 650S is not really a TCU, but it is in a P1. So yeah. it required basically a complete rewire of the transmission controller and the rear active arrow stuff, which is complete. Okay, that is very, very good. Uh, so this is the TCU connector, right? Correct. That is a transmission control unit. And then this goes all the way into here, goes and then goes all the way back here. And then that also goes into the active aerodynamics of the rear of the car. So having that done is a very, very big step. Um, so uh, round of applause for Adam. Yay! Yay! I, I have, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Sound of one hand clapping. When we get to over here, this is where things kind of start to fall apart a little bit, but there is a method to the madness because we are gonna lop this off and we actually have one of the connectors well, a style of the connector that we're gonna use, and it's called a mil-spec connector, well, essentially a, bul a bulkhead connector, and um, I wanna show you how that works. This connector right here looks freaking dope. Look at that. So that's one part of the connector, and then the other part is? This guy. Right here? Yep, so this is the mating half. Now we have all the pins in here, mm -hmm. but we're not using those right now, but basically this is a quarter turn quick disconnect, so, Parts go together. Um, yep. That's something like that. Something, something like that. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then you do a quarter of a turn, and that's completely connected and sealed. And watertight. Watertight. We're gonna need watertight in this build. <laughs> uh, I think it's very, very necessary. So <laughs> can we make sure it's a that? It's a shame they didn't think of that from the factory. I know, I know. But if this if this has a plunge, you know, I want it to be. If it has a little splash, I want it to be okay. We don't need any more swimming hypercars in Florida. We have enough of those. Well, this might self drive itself into the nearest lake. These connectors. Well, this one's made of. Is this plastic or metal? This is aluminum. Yeah, this is a uh, billet aluminum, and it's anodized black. Mm -hmm. um, they come in silver, black, and olive drab green for the military, you know? Okay, what, what about gold? We should have gold. Uh, I gold mean, connectors. That, that would have to be custom, which, you know. I mean, we could do, we could do custom. But this looks, like it'll, you know, go it'll with the okay. carbon, it'll look good. It'll be okay. So, uh, one of those connectors is how much money? Uh, about $250, generally speaking. To one of these little guys, and we need, okay. like, um, eight. <laughs> okay, so we need sixteen hundred dollars in connectors. More or less. Just just connectors, not like anything else. We've already spent quite a bit on wiring and other stuff. We have something else that I want to show people, um, and this is quite possibly 
the biggest breakthrough we've had on this project. And uh, Adam, so right there, he's, you're you're barely smirking. And like, <laughs> dude, this is this is a big deal. It's yeah. a really big deal. Yeah. This is a big deal. So it may look like we have a lot of work to do, and that is absolutely the case. But I wanted to show you guys the first signs of life of this car since it's been in the flood. And I know the car is not here, but this is the central nervous system that we're building of the car. And this car has never had any power gone through it after the flood. Uh, nothing's ever lit up. Uh, the closest I've ever been is turning on a fan or using a uh, window switch. But I think right now, since we're checking all of the circuits and everything like that, we need to see if this harness actually works. And a really good way to check that is by using this. This is the uh, gauge cluster, and it's not even the gauge cluster for a P1. Actually, one thing you might not know is that the P1 has the exact same gauge cluster as an early 570S. And it'll have like different displays and everything, but I wanted to modify my P1, so we have a later model 570S. It has one big LED screen instead of three, and we can modify anything we want in this. But I'm gonna test out if this works. And not only this, we're gonna see if the headlights work and maybe some other stuff as well. So um, if this works, we're actually powering up the fuse box. If this works, that means the P1 is officially alive. And I can't tell you how excited I am uh, to hear that because that just means that we have to button everything up. We have to make sure, you know, all the other components work, but this is a big step in the right direction. Um, I know I'm talking a lot because I'm a little nervous, uh, but we have a power supply here. And um, so how do you, how do you? You just hit the button on the front. The button on the front? Yeah. Okay, I'm, this is, has been wired into the fuse box and all that stuff, and it's been... It's plugged into the dash harness. It's plugged into the dash harness. Uh, so the harness is stock. We're not we're not just putting it straight into the back of this. Um, so... Yeah, yeah, it's not like we're... We have everything, like, actually connected here. Why am I nervous? Why am I nervous, dude? And... Go. <gasps> Look at it! Look at it! It says McLaren! Okay. <laughs> Display is on. Obviously, no sensors are reporting anything. This is amazing! This is so cool! Oh my, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. This is the first sign of life, the first sign of actual life that this P1 has. And oh, oh, oh buddy. Oh, buddy, this is going to be good. I can't believe that worked. Adam, you did a good job. Yeah. You, you did a really good job. So far. Yeah, so far. So far. Adam did a good job. So far. I want to try out the headlights. The eyes of this thing have to light up. Three, two, one. Oh, dude. It works. What the? <laughs> Look at this. Look, it's alive. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah! Oh my, look, look at, oh, that's bright. That's really bright. I, I went into the beam of light. It's, it's, it's very, very bright. Holy hell. Oh, buddy, this feels good. This feels really good. So, I guess all we need to do is get the car back and put this all in the car and hope everything else works. Man, I, I feel good. I feel, I feel really good. Woo! There we go.